this morning as we preach this message, I'm going to be laying the groundwork for the next few messages. Tonight we're going to be sharing a little bit about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Brother Bledsoe is teaching on Wednesday night about the Holy Spirit, who He is, and, and the, the attributes of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the evidence of the church. And He is going to be preaching. It's kind of a, we're, I believe God is trying to get it through our heads that we are Pentecostals and the Holy Spirit is in us and moving for us. Amen? So we want you to be tonight's service, next Sunday morning, next Sunday night. We're going to be sharing about the Holy Spirit Wednesday night. I believe we are doing our best to preach about who He is. If there's anything that the church or the body of believers needs today is more of the evidence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Amen. Amen. The power of God, the work of God to see us through where we are. I want to preach this morning. If you have your Bibles, there's a very familiar section of Scripture. It's found in Acts, the second chapter. I'm going to be preaching from verses 1 through 4 this morning. The title of my message is very simple. It's, what does it mean to be Pentecostal? What does it mean to be Pentecostal? Laura, if I get going too fast and, and I don't give you a chance, I just wanted to tell you, if you need the translating devices, she is back there translating, and she is going to stay up with me if you are listening. Sometimes the radio devices, we've had some problems with them as you listen to it. If you have trouble with that, just go back there and see her. She'll direct you to another headset. Sometimes that happens. So just to let you know. Scripture reads as this, in Acts the second chapter, starting in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. They were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided, their divided tongues as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And the Bible goes on in verse 4 and it says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want you to bow your heads for the next few minutes and just open your hearts as God speaks to us about what it means to be, to be Pentecostal. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. I pray that you would anoint this physical body that God, nothing of me would hinder what you wish to do. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through these lips of clay and God that you would touch the hearts of each one that's here today. Let us not just hear with our ears, but let us hear with our heart that we would receive. And to those who need a touch from you today, to those who need your presence today, may they receive the work that you wish to do in them today. And we'll give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for that that is done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The first thing that I want to do is I want to share with you some misconceptions of what it is to be Pentecostal. As I was telling you, I met a, a man, and I know I don't, we never did talk about what he believed. He basically asked me what I believed, and I told him I was Pentecostal. And his thought in that passage, and, and when I told him that I was Pentecostal, he began to talk about, oh, those are those wild, crazy people. I said, well, we are, there's a lot of us that are crazy. I can tell you, I'm just looking out over, you know, just, but... We begin to talk about what it is and what Pentecost is, and begin to talk to him a little about what I what I was instructed to be. He said, "Well, I heard that Pentecost they just run the aisles, and the whole time you're at church, you just shout and and, and, and you just speak in tongues, and nobody knows what anybody else is saying, and, and it's all that." And I said, "You've been watching too much television." I said, "And you've been listening to the wrong people." Pentecost is about the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost happened long before the second chapter of Acts. Now that was when the first feast of Pentecost and the day of Pentecost, and most people that say they're Pentecostals mark their history too, is on in Acts the second chapter when the day of uh, Pentecost was fully come and that the power of God fell widely upon his believers. But the power of Pentecost was all the way back into the Old Testament. Amen? And it was way back when it's been a celebrated feast for years and years prior to ever seeing it on the day of Pentecost. But there are so many misconceptions of what Pentecost is. Go ahead and pull those up. More, it's just more than a shout. Amen? Come on. Yeah, we can be loud, and I'm loud, and I like to be loud, and I am. Uh, when, I, when somebody says I'm Pentecostal and, and, and I'm loud and proud of it, yes, I am. Amen? Somebody said, well, you're just over-emotional people. Yes, we are. Amen. Amen. 
somebody said, well, I'm more reserved. I'm more quiet. I, I would rather sit by the side. Well, let me tell you, I can show you that you can be emotional. Don, I think we can do this. Remember when we were laying those papers and I smashed my finger? I became very emotional. My owl was not very quiet. It was loud and, I, and it hurt. And I went, ow! I became very enthralled with the pain. I can tell you this. You can be emotional even though you can be reserved. You're emotional about what you choose to be emotional about. You're loud about what you choose to be loud about. Come on. Now, if you're celebrating the winner of a ball of your favorite team, or you're celebrating the victory that you have, and, and say you beat your brother in basketball, say say he would beat you, and and he would go crazy, and he would run around, yeah, I beat him, I beat him. That's like Joe trying to say he beat me in wrestling the other day. He was yelling and hollering and everything. We're very quiet, but I can tell you this: when it comes to what we are proud of, we become loud about it. Amen? Amen. And when, when, we, when we come to it, I, I never will forget uh, Sister Logan, when she and her and Brother Logan were here, and, and they were watching the year that we won the World Series here in the Arizona Diamondbacks. And Sister uh, uh, Logan was quiet and reserved. Now, she would talk to you, but you didn't see a whole lot of, you know, just over. But when the Diamondbacks won, she was screaming and hollering and yelling about it. I'm going to tell you something. You are emphatically thrilled and loud about what you are proud of and part of. Amen. Come on, amen. Yeah, amen. <clears throat> when you're proud of the American uh, flag and you're proud of the nation that you're a part of and you're proud of it, you wave that flag high above it. Amen. 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 I, mean, I saw a guy driving down the road the other day and he had flags coming out of the back of his trucks and they stuck up, must have been 10 feet tall out of the back of his truck and he was driving down the road and they were flapping in the wind. And I'm thinking, boy, that guy is a proud American. Joey looked over at me and he goes, no, he's just a redneck that didn't know where else to put his flags. <laughs> I don't know about I don't know about that, but he was proud of it. I can tell you this. Now, it's more than a shallow head. It's, it's more than tongues. And a lot of times, all we hear about is when we talk about Pentecost, and being Pentecostal, we talk about the gibberish of tongues. And a lot of times, we talk about the nature of when someone would speak in tongues. And that is evident in Scripture, and I believe in it. Amen? It is documented. I can show you over and over again through the book of Acts, over and over again through the New Testament, where they spoke in tongues. Now, you can argue with it, you can point it out, and you can, and, and there have been many that have tried to dispute it, but I can tell you this tongues is a part of the church. It's the evidence of the believer when we are baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Paul wrote about it many times. Luke wrote about it. There are many, Jesus even taught his disciples, go and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. That power was evident in the life of the believers when they spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost. Amen. But Pentecost is more than speaking in tongues. Yes. Amen. Amen. That is a part of it, but it is more than speaking in tongues. And we have made it in the Pentecostal church about the evidence of tongues, and it is more than that. I want to go on. It is more than an emotional work, and I've already discussed that, but it is much more than that. And I, I know that somebody says, well, Pentecostals are just emotional people, and we get excited about it. I, don't, I get excited about a lot of things. But yes, when I worship the Lord, I am emotional. Come on, amen? Amen. Some of you need to understand, when you're worshiping the Lord, you should be emotional. Amen. Amen. There's something to be emotional about. Is it quiet in here today, or is it just me? <laughs> the loud crowd is gone today, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> the timing is perfect on that guy. I can tell you this. That when you become emotional about God, the presence of God will transform. How many of you know when the teapot gets the hottest, it sings out the loudest? Right. Sometimes we've got to realize that when we come in, I believe this with all my heart. The reason that some people don't get emotional in their worship and they don't get emotional about God is because they're half-heartedly serving Him. 
Is it okay if I meddle just a little bit? God, I want you to fill me with you. Come on, man. If you want all of it, lift it up and open up your hearts to it. Amen. If, if I want it more than anything, lift your hearts up, open up your heart, and begin to say, God, I want all of you. When I was wrestling, and I just started in wrestling, I was in my younger years before I ever got to high school wrestling. I was just learning a little bit about it. And I was getting, you know, I wasn't very big, and they were beating me all over the place. And the coach said, you got to get in there, and you've got to show them that you mean business. He said, you've got to be physical. You've got to put your heart into it. I didn't really know what that meant, and I was, so I was kind of watching this. Uh, there was a, there's a, a little movie that was on a few years ago of, of some little kites that played football, and they gave them, they told them, you got to show your opponents that you're mean. You got to growl. You got to put out the seltzer in your mouth and let foam come out of your mouth. You got to look mean. You got to, you got to, and they put on their mean look, and, and I promise you, some of them boys could not look mean if they had to. But they had all their heart into it. And I looked at me and I was trying to put my mean look on in the mirror. And I went in there and I put my mean look on and the only thing I could do was laugh. No wonder my opponents were beating me. I finally figured out you can be happy and still be mean business. Emotionalism is not being quiet. The part of us that makes us who we are is that we let ourselves worship God completely. Amen? When we worship the Lord completely, we open up our hearts to who He is. When you know all that the God has done, maybe He's just done so much more for me than He has for you that you, you that when I worship, I realize and recognize where He brought me from, James. I realize what all He's done, how He's healed me and helped me and strengthened me, how He's delivered me and how, how He's blessed me. I can't help it but when I became emotional is because I remember when I was lost, He found me. When I didn't know anything about anything else in this world, I know that the power of the Holy Spirit was there. And I can't help but be emotional because of the work that He's done in me. Has He done anything in you today? Amen. Come on, has He, has he done anything? People in my life would say he'll never amount to anything. God said he's my chosen. When the world rejected me, God chose me. And the power of God makes a difference in the life of those who commit their hearts to him. When you glorify the Lord and you worship him, do it with all of your heart. Some say it's Pentecostalism is just emotional or self-indulgence. It's when we gratify ourselves. I don't know, sometimes when I think about the idea of the feel-good preachers, those who try to pad the paddings and try to make you feel good when you leave, is oftentimes what I call self-indulgence, where I get what I want when I want it, and I don't want to argue about it. Come on. Yeah. When you were growing up, now I know that generations have changed. I know the world has changed since... The way we eat has changed. But when I was growing up, whatever Brother Bledsoe was put on the table, that's what I ate. If we had liver and onions, I ate liver and onions. Whenever we had, uh, I, I, I did not eat the sauerkraut and onions. I did not eat those. My mom liked sauerkraut and onions, and I did not eat it. But I didn't get anything else. Nowadays, we say, what do you want, honey? Look at the menu over there and tell me what you want. And then when we eat dinner at home, we'll fix whatever you want. What do you want for dinner? <laughs> you know, your mom doesn't do that to you. Does she? <laughs> I, I want pizza. Well, I don't want pizza. I want a hamburger. I don't. So, so we go to places where we can choose and pick. I'm going to tell you something. Some of us try to do that with God. We want to self-indulge to the point where we come and we, we, put, we look at the menu and we say, I'll take that today, God. And then I'll, we go down and, oh, I don't want that. I want this. I'm going to tell you something. When we come to the house of God, we want all of him. Amen. Amen. I want everything that he has for me. I want everything. When I 
to come in. I want all that he has. The Bible says he has prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemy. When you came in this house, God had already prepared what you needed today. If you walk away from God's house hungry, it's because you didn't come to the table prepared to eat what God had planned for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's good preaching. I might as well quit right there, but I'll go on. <laughs> the origin of Pentecost started, if you will, go back into the feast in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. The origin of Pentecost started years ago as the children of Israel had traveled across the wilderness and God had brought them through it. And we know that the Passover started when they were leaving Egypt and they had left. And the Bible tells us about all that he had told them on the 14th day of the month that they were to celebrate Passover, which is the death of the lamb put up on the doorposts of the hearts uh, of the individual so that the death angel would pass by. And that represents so much. Everything that the feasts have in the Old Testament is symbolic to the New Testament. I can show you theologically, I can show you evidently, where if you go back and read through the 23rd Psalms, the Passover represents the Passover of the death angel. I'm going to tell you something, there's only one way to leave this world without the fear of death, and that is through Jesus Christ, the, the Lamb that was slain. And if you have Him applied to the doorposts of your heart, and you have Him represented, you will promise that you have eternal life. Amen. 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 The Passover is significant in all of the parts of it. We also see the, the Feast of Weeks, and we see that as we go through the, the different feasts that are in the 23rd chapter. As we lead into it, everything about it represents to Pentecost. And Pentecost represents to us 50 days from Passover. The Lord began to show the children of Israel that in 50 days they would have an outpouring, an opportunity, a blessing of the harvest. We are the blessing of the harvest. Pentecost is to celebrate the harvest. Jesus said to the church, go out into the highways and, and the hedges and compel them to come in. He tells us to go and preach the gospel to every living creature and every nature of what God has told us. The church today is about the harvest, about the lost and the dying world around us. We have made church about us feeling good coming into the house. But it is not about us. It's about the world that's lost. Amen. The harvest is what Pentecost is about. 50 days. The actual word Pentecost means uh, to, to mean 50 or 50 days, if you will. The, it, it, believe it or not, the, the word Pentecost is not in the Old Testament, but it represents through the feast that they had, that they celebrated the Feast of Weeks. The 50 weeks, 49 days, and on the 50th day, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. What did God do in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost? He commissioned the church for harvest. He said, now, remember what he said in Luke? He said, tarry it till you be endued with power from on high. The power that they endued in the upper room. He said, go back into Jerusalem, pray and seek me. And seek the Holy Spirit until He comes. They did. They weren't seeking tongues. They weren't speaking, seeking emotionalism. They weren't. They weren't seeking it. What they were seeking for is the power that was promised to Him that he, they could do the work that He had told them to do to reach a lost and dying world. Amen. Amen. We can't reach this lost world without the help and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The power of God moving upon us with boldness to proclaim it, to share it. In the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, the 15th chapter, he says, Now count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, and that the, the last day of the Passover, he said, uh, From the day that you brought the sheep and the wave offerings, the seventh Sabbath shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Notice what it says here. You shall bring uh, from your dwelling two wave loaves, two tents of ephod, and they shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven, that they be to be a first fruits to the Lord. Now there's a lot to be said in that, and I could preach there for a while, but I, I want to point out something in verse 17. The first part of that is, is when they come into it, 
And he begins to talk about the wave offering earlier in that. It's only of one. They only wave one. And they wave it with unleavened bread. The perfection of it. Here he's talking about bringing two. The Gentile and the Jew together. So that he talks about all that. Amen? Amen. The two coming together as one. Amen? Amen. Is anybody getting what I'm saying here today? I want you to understand that the Old Testament and the New Testament don't conflict. It's the same God who designed it so we would have the opening and understanding of what he's doing. Amen. Amen. But far, I believe there's another feast that's about to happen. The Feast of Trumpets. I believe the Bible says it's not going to be very long from now. I believe that, that the Lord is going to sound the trumpet and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen. I believe there's going to be a trumpet sounding and the trumpet's going to and the feast of trumpets will be the celebration of the going home that all of us will celebrate in. Amen. Amen. That's a whole other message. Don't preach that. <laughs> But when we look at this and the first fruits of this, understanding this, that it gives us the hope and the help that we understand. He uses the word and he describes it of leaven being in this baked bread. Now notice when you go back and you read through Leviticus that you will see that in the first part of that, when they have the unleavened bread, it's taking out the sin. Here I'm going to tell you something. We can't take our sin away. Amen? No matter how hard we try to work at it, we cannot remove our sin. There is only one way to have our sins forgiven, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Doesn't matter how good you try to be, doesn't matter how hard you work at it, or what you do to try to make yourself better, no matter what self-help you try to do, you can't do it to get to heaven. When we look at that, we see the power of Pentecost. We see what it is. You see what Pentecost is and what, a, what is a Pentecostal. Those who believe it, I want to quickly go through these. What is it to be a Pentecostal? What is a Pentecostal? Let's look at this very quickly. First part of this says, the one who believes in the experience of God sending forth every believer by his power. Look at what the scripture says here. It says, but you shall receive power, then the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in, to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the church is still <coughs> needing the power of God to set forth to do its work. Amen. In me I can do nothing, but in him all things are possible. Amen. When I became more and more submissive to the call of God in my life, I, began, I decided that I, I, all the excuses that I could make, that I was shy, that I didn't have the knowledge, that I, I had reading difficulties, I, I kept coming up with different excuses why I couldn't. But when I stood before God, I knew this, and I had one preacher tell me this. He said, when you stand before God, there will be no excuse good enough why you didn't do what he called you to do. Because with, help, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can do all things. When the power of God is on a believer, you can run through a troop and leap over a wall. The power of the enemy does not have power against you. What I could not do in myself, I can do in him. When I look at this, I begin to see that. That's why it's so important that we need to understand the power of the Holy Spirit when it comes upon us. Next, we realize that it is one who desires to become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You see, Pentecost is not about self-indulgence. It's about self-surrender. Pentecost is giving yourself to God and say, God, whatever you choose, I will surrender to. Amen. Amen. When it comes down to it, we, we must realize that it is his control that we submit to. And when we realize that, that, that self-indulgence is not what Pentecost is about, but it's about self-sacrifice, it becomes much popular because people don't want to give up their will. It is. When we come to it and we look at it and we hear it and we see it in the lives of people in the church. I grew up and I wanted to tell God what I wanted to do for my career, what I wanted to do for my life, and I had everything else. Inside, I knew that God was pulling me towards a calling to his ministry. But I was not willing to say, Holy Spirit, have your way in me. All I could do was make excuses why I couldn't. I had problems, I had issues. 
I had everything. I had all these things. And God said, one by one, he took care of those things. And he will in every life of every believer who truly says, God, what you will, I will do. You can sit right here and tell me all the excuses why you can't. Or you can submit to God as a self-sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. And know that he is going to anoint that sacrifice and make it for his glory and his honor and his praise. You see, it's, it's the work that God wants us to do when we become an acceptable, desirable purpose for Him. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Go ahead and pull the next one up. God also tells us one who is Pentecostal is one who allows the spirit of living water to flow from, uh, from us as God promised. And God begins to promise us that. The Bible tells us that. Go ahead and show that scripture. And it says, He who believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Amen. 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 You want to see the church change? You want to see believers change? You want to see the life of people change? When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them and breaks the strongholds in their life. We need heart healing. Amen? Amen? Out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of, look, notice what it says there. That, that the scripture says, out of his heart will flow. Let me tell you something. If bitterness and anger and frustration, if, if all of those things are what's flowing out of you, then you need heart help. Amen? Amen. If that's all that's in you is, is what the enemy has said in your mind and said in your heart, then you need heart help today. Amen? What you need to do is come before God and say, God, let the Holy Spirit flow through me and heal me. Heal my heart so that out of me will flow rivers of living water. Something that touches and moves and transforms. Believe it or not, God doesn't want to use you and heal you and deliver you. And, and he doesn't want to bless you with the job or the work that he's given you just so you can say, look what I've got. It's so that he can flow through you to touch others with it. And the more that he flows through you, the more he makes room. You know, as a river starts, it starts in a small branch. And as the water flows and it builds, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. They have evidence to say that as the rivers flow after the, and what most, I don't know why I'm going down this path, but it's, after the, the flood, the rivers reserved their rights and who made the rivers where they were and what they did. They, they begin to flow. And they work their way through. And if water flows long enough through something, it will make room and it make it wider. And it begins to be wider. What I'm going to tell you something is the more that God flows through you, the wider he can be to bless you with more. Amen. And the more that you are blessed, the more that he's making room for. Amen. He doesn't bless you to be a reservoir. He blesses you to be a river. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but I'm getting blessed just hearing what God's doing in me. Because he wants to use me. And he wants the power of the Holy Spirit to flow through me. Not just to sit in me and become stagnant. But to flow through me. He didn't call you to be a little pond. <laughs> I found out something. that You know that moving water is usually clearer. And cleaner. Than water that sits still. And if you find a water that has a living spring in it, it's some of the best water that you can drink. But if you have water that's sitting, has been stagnant, and becomes discolored. I remember one time I was with my dad, and we were fishing, and, and we were fishing in a hole, and there was, it was mossed, and there was no water running into it. It was just a, an old pond, and back behind it, and there were some big fish in it. And I caught a fish, and I told my dad, I said, man, I can't wait to go home and eat it. He said, son, you don't need to eat fish out of a dead pond. He said, if you want to eat good fish, you need to get it out of flowing water. I'm going to tell you something. I can't, I, I can't, I'm, the Holy Spirit is speaking to some hearts today. What he's wanting you to do is let the Lord bless you so you can be a bigger blessing for him. Use what you've been given so he can flow through you to make more room for more to come. When we allow the Spirit to move upon us, as He promises us, He will use us for His glory. The purpose of Pentecost is very simply this. 
And I, I, I was very careful with this because I know next week I'm going to pick this piece up. I'm going to be preaching a little bit more about it tonight. But the purpose of Pentecost is this. Go ahead, Dave. Pentecost is about the harvest, not just tongues. It's about reaching the lost. Pentecost is about the harvest. It's a feast of the harvest. In Leviticus, it's a feast of the first fruits of the harvest. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he became the first fruits. In Corinthians, it tells us that. And the Bible tells us that. He is the first fruits of the hope of the new believer. He is the first fruits. And then we are the first fruits. And God uses us and waves us when our life is changed. We become that example. We are the, 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 the bread that he's waving. Saying, look at my child whose life was lost, but now it's found. We begin to see the work of God. You see, it's not about just about tongues, but it's about the harvest. Pentecost is the birth of the church. The church had never existed up to that point. Amen. You will never see it in the Old Testament up to what it says. Do you know that the church becomes alive at Pentecost? Amen. Up to that time, it was a family. It was the Jews. If you weren't a Jew, you weren't of God. You weren't of the, of the God of, of creation. You, you could be outside, but you couldn't be a part of it. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, he brought both the Jew and the Gentile together, and he waved us both. And he said, you are both lost, but now you're fine. Amen. Amen. And the sins of, the, of what you are and what you used to be no longer matter. I don't know about you, but when I begin to look at Pentecost and I begin to see the idea of the birth of the church, I'm glad that we are still here today because the world needs a church. The world needs a church that's on fire for God. The world needs a church that's excited about who they are and what God is doing in their life. I'm going to meddle just a minute, and then I'll get back to my message. Did you want me to tell you why so many of us have trouble bringing people to church? Because of the way that we act when we ask them. If you look like you just sucked a bucket of lemons, why would anyone want to come to your church? Or if you're grouchy and you're mad all the time. Oh, I'm going to church. And pastor. Oh, and the people in that church. They always shake hands and hug you. Oh my goodness. I'm going to church. You want to go? I'm just telling you. If you're excited about what God's done in you, if you're excited about the work that God is doing, if you're excited about God and you begin to tell people how excited you are about all that God is, let me tell you something. It becomes contagious. Yeah. They'll come to see what's wrong with you. <laughs> when you are excited about it, when, you, when, you, when you're open and you're saying, I am blessed, I am blessed every day that I am blessed, they become curious to see what's going on in your life. Come with me to church. presence and the power of God is there. The worship is great. We have new seats and padded seats that are, that are so thick that you just sink down in them. The carpet is new and the pastor is so good looking and, and we do all of those things. Lord, did you translate that right? I just want to make sure you got that. So when we, when we, but when we, we if we talk negatively, what do people hear? They don't hear anything positive, only the negative. Amen. That's why the Bible says, let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. Sometimes you need to shut your mouth and stop talking negative and speak positive. Amen? Amen. Now, is this church perfect? No. Are the things missing? Yes. That's why we pray for the church. That's why we pray for one another. God, you know what we're missing. You know what we need. God, help us to rise up to the challenge. Raise up leaders. Raise up men and women to serve you and work for you. You know what we need. Be positive about it. Amen? Amen. When I, when I was a kid, I, I would invite my friends to come to church. And one of my favorite things to tell them was, when you go to church at my church, we get snacks. <laughs> I heard one of the kids telling another kid on BBS, they were playing around outside. 
and they were talking about, you should come to church on Sunday morning to our church. When you come early enough, you get donuts. <laughs> and the little the woman there, she was talking to, she looked over, she goes, real donuts? <laughs> yeah, real donuts. And you get to pick which one you want. And then she kind of got negative, though. She said, sometimes they cut them in half. <laughs> <laughs> The other girl goes, well, if you get there early enough, you can eat both halves before anybody else gets there. <laughs> Some of you say, well, I didn't even know the church sold donuts. That, that, we give them away free. But the reason that you don't know we have donuts is you're not here early enough <laughs> to get donuts. That's good preaching, isn't it, Pastor? <laughs> Go ahead, pull that next one. When we realize the purpose of Pentecost, Pentecost is about the harvest. Pentecost is God's plan. God's plan is for the church to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Pentecost is the power and the promise of God, but it's the fulfillment of God's plan to reap the lost world. That's what Pentecost is about. Go ahead one more time. Pentecost is for every believer. You see, every believer that believes truly about the message and the discernment of it, whether you speak in tongues or not, that is not the question of being Pentecostal. When you are harvest-minded and soul-minded, you become Pentecostal. When I finished talking to that gentleman that I met, I told him, I said, it's harvest-minded people that are Pentecostals. He goes, well, I believe in preaching the gospel. And he said, I believe in sharing it to the lost. And I believe we need more people to do that. And he was all fired up then. And I said, so you're Pentecostal. He goes, no, I don't do all those other things. I said, that don't matter. Pentecostals are not just the ones who speak in tongues. Pentecostals are those who believe the harvest. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's, a, that's what I'm going to preach a little bit about. When I'm going to go there to David, I will tell you this. What the baptism of the Holy Spirit was, was the evidence of the coming of the power and the promise of God in the life of the believer. You believe this, that God will not give you a gift and force it on you. He will not make you take it. But if you believe it, you can receive it. But if you don't believe it, why would you accept it? When it comes down to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need to understand when the believers were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they were seeking after God. That's what they were seeking after. Not tongues, not anything else. They were seeking after the promise that Jesus told them of. And the outpouring and the evidence of that promise was tongues. Go ahead. We are Pentecostal. We are Pentecostal when we preach the gospel. We are Pentecostal. If we are Pentecostals, then let's get all God has. So we can reach all He wants in His great harvest. You see, the reason that the church is still here, and I truly believe this, that is God's plan and timing. Roberto, if you'll come and play. Play me some of that quitting music, will you? <laughs> You see, I believe this with, with all my heart, that the reason the church is still here, the reason that God has not chosen to stay at home is because the harvest is not completely in yet. But God has a time, and that time is already etched in. Just like when the fullness of Jesus came. Prophecies were all fulfilled, and everything was done, and the timing was right. I believe that we're coming very closely to that time. When the, the Bible, when we talked about it, the trump of God shall sound. I said it yesterday at the funeral, at the going home party for Valerie. I said, if you want to see her again, you got to live it right here. One of her granddaughters came to church with her a lot. She was very upset and emotional about it. She said, I miss my grandmother. I'll never see her again. I'll never see her again. And everybody, oh, you're okay. Grandma's thinking about you. I put my arm around her when nobody else was there close to her. We were sitting in those two big chairs in the entryway. She was sitting in the chair beside me. And I said, can I tell you something? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you let him live in your heart, you'll see your grandma again. She won't be hurting. 
she won't be in pain. But you'll see her again. Now she's just gone on a little bit before you, and though you won't see her physically, she's <coughs> ready for you when you get there. I know this. I know this. That the greatest thing that we can have is the hope that this is not all there is. I'm going to tell you something. Some of us have had loved ones and family members and friends that have gone on before us. And, and instead of saying goodbye at a funeral, I'll, basically what I'll say is I'll see you soon. You just got there. I told Valerie the last time when she was still able to talk. And we were talking at her bedside. I took her by the hand and I said, Valerie, I'm jealous. I'm so jealous of you getting to go home before I get to that time, I was feeling sorry for myself for the blood soak because my knee was hurting. And I had a headache. And when I knelt beside a woman who was dying of cancer, she said, Pastor, all I can think about is the beauty of what heaven is. I don't know what the future is. This We don't have long to work in this harvest field. Quickly, quickly, things are progressing so fast. Things are changing so fast. We don't have a lot of time. And I believe that's the urgency of the church's hour today. Just to ready the hearts. To share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone we need. It is important for us to realize the time is now. Pentecost thrust the church into the call, into the harvest field work. Where you are, in the lives that you touch, they need the gospel message. Can you imagine what would change at your schools if just one young person got on fire for the, with, with, a, with an explosive passion for Christ? It can change a high school. I, I can show you book after book of young people who got on fire and changed it. The devil tried to do everything he can. Even if, if you look at the Columbine story, the message of Columbine, if people would just realize what one believer can do when they're on fire for God, how it can change. It can change your work. It can change the people around you. It can change your family. It can change because Pentecost and the experience of the power of God in the life of the believer. It's time that we become harvest-minded, that we realize it is important for us in the lateness of this hour, if everything is, is lining up and all the, all the things, if you, if you read the newspapers and you read things, how they're changing and how they're going, not just here in the United States, but in, if you look at what's going on in Israel, if you look at what's going on in the global scene, if you look at all that's going around the world, you can't help but know that we are on the edge. I believe, Brother Farr, that in heaven, you can hear... I don't know if you've ever been to a, I know Laura, you guys were not too long ago at your son's school, but the orchestra, when they sit down and they get ready, and they start moving those chairs and they squeak on those floors. They start strumming their instruments a little bit and they tune them up and they're getting ready. I, I believe all that's happening right now is the chairs are moving and the instruments are beginning to be tuned. And the trumpeter is about ready to stand up Blow us more. I believe it's that close. I believe there is a sound that rumbles in the, in the universe that says it's about that time. Now before I leave, before we dismiss this service, I would be very wrong in telling you this. That if you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart, and your life doesn't show it, have you really made that commitment? If I'm living my life to change, you see, the power of Pentecost also brought change in the life of the believer. Their lives were never the same. Though shy, many of them were fishermen. Many of them were unlearned and untaught. But they became bold and ferocious. They, become, they were able to stand in the presence of wise men and speak the word of God with confidence, knowing that even their lives were threatened, but still spoke boldly and openly of that. 
That's what can happen in the lives of believers when we become truly Pentecostal.